And if you don't know why we're laughing, look at him. Very well written, very well directed, very well acted. Boy, does that not disappoint. That said, this was a kids R-rated movie. You don't understand fart jokes if you don't understand how the world views them. And that's where, yeah, the richness of the film came from. A little bit of magic that came from it. It's just a different type of magic. The cinema aspect of what I'm watching and what I'm supposed to be feeling while I'm watching that. If you think about how simple these interactions were, they're so complex. Today's uh, podcast is... Today's episode of the Four Seasons of Film podcast is brought to you by Phil's Coffee. Phil's specializes in handcrafted coffee made one cup at a time. Voted best coffee by SF Weekly in 2013 and 2014. Visit a location today or find them on the web at philscoffee.com. That's Phil's with a Z, coffee.com. Find the beans you're looking for. Muscles are firm. Not a straight body in these statues. They're all curved. Sometimes impossibly curved. And so nonchalant, hence their ageless ambiguity. In northern Italy in 1983, 17-year-old Elio begins a relationship with Oliver, his father's research assistant, with whom he bonds over his emerging sexuality, their Jewish heritage, and the beguiling Italian landscape. You only knew how little I know about the things Nominated for Best Picture, Best Actor, and Best Adapted Screenplay, and Best Original Song, Luca Guadagnino's Call Me By Your Name is the subject of tonight's Four Seasons of Film podcast. Call me by your name and I'll call you by mine. Hello everyone, welcome to the Four Seasons of Film podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Robert Blackburn. Winter is upon us still, and we have two more movies to cover for the Four Seasons of Film winter podcast. Tonight being the Best Picture nominated, Call Me By Your Name, and tonight... I'll be joined by Scotty Brown. Hey, Scotty. Hey. Call Me By Your Name is what we're talking about tonight. And uh, Luca Guadagnino, who directs a uh, movie starring Army Hammer. And Timothy Chalamet. 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 It's like a Chalamet. champagne. Uh-huh. Sounds fancy, yeah. Yeah. This is a foreign film, I would say, that gets a nod by the Best Picture nomination uh, for this year. A lot of people put this on their best picture list of the year. Christopher Nolan had this on his list. Uh, so did Paul Thomas Anderson. Edgar Wright, I think, even had this on his list. And this was one that I I, I always think, there's, there's movies like this where they're in the, the, the foreign film category and they right. make it into the, the long-lasting Oscar race. But there are so many foreign films out there. Sometimes they slip in and you don't even hear about them until right when they're nominated. Right. right, and this was one that really not not only did it got, get nominated for for best picture, but it gets nominated for best adapted screenplay, best song, and and best actor. Timothy Chalamet. Yeah, I mean, as much as we want to say it's a foreign film, uh, James Ivory did do the screenplay, and he sounds like he did like something I've known. Merchant Ivory, the Merchant productions Ivory. back in the eighties, oh, all the British, yeah, okay, uh, yeah. Room with the View, all the way up to uh, the, the like mid nineties. Beautiful films, was, uh, really. Oh yeah, great yeah. films. The Reigns of the Day is yeah. one of the best movies. But he was a uh, uh, an Academy darling from like 1985 to 92. <laughs> I guess the only as far as other movies. I mean, he's the only one that like stands out. Luca Guadini or how God, how do we say his name? Luca Luca has <laughs> <laughs> no. He's a, he's a, he's a little more out there. But I am love cracked through a little bit. Oh shit! That was this guy. And I with uh, I was Tilda gonna, Swinton, he damn it! I was gonna times. watch that one. Okay, that, and that's the thing. I would call it a foreign film only because the to the spirit. To which the film is shot and performed, and the general feeling of this is, I don't think that it would have been as artfully or as beautifully done if it was not filmed by this director. No. And also combined in that beautiful way, like you're saying, with someone who, who had a hand behind or who wrote uh, *Room with a View*, which is this beautiful movie. All the same, it's it's this movie for me combines two things: my love for '60s. Uh, French tourism, even though it's set, it's set in Italy, which is fine, um, but still the same kind of European uh, tourism of the 60s, and sort of period dramas, or I would say beautiful cinematography with bright, uh, beautiful landscapes, mm-hmm. and you know th- that sort of 
something about David Leanish about this, or or like a Pressburger uh, or Newman kind of thing. Absolutely, about they, this that foreign that foreign aspect of just the the material and the way that it it's it's dealt with, and the beauty of the of, of the fact that they're shooting nature as it is, but they're capturing the you know the beautiful greenness of a tree or a you know a weird you know just gorgeous looking backgrounds but they're right. also adding colors with buildings and lighting and things like that there is a foreign feel all throughout this movie which is why i think it it is absolutely one of the best of the year well the movie the movie speaks to what love is and and the landscape must be love and the people must be in love and the movie must be about love so if you're not feeling that while you're watching this in totality then you're not going to love this movie. And one of the reasons I do love this movie is because it has all of those things. People keep harping on this, and, and I, I tend to agree with them every single time. You're watching this movie from what it really felt like to be in love for the first time as a teenager. Mm -hmm. And the weird thing about it is, most people's first love does happen when you are younger than the person you fall in love with. Right. You're, you're always... But not necessarily you have a sexual relationship with them. That's not what I mean. It's just the feeling of that love from a very young age, I think, is very relatable to most people, combined with the fact that you're in this romantic setting, you're over in Italy. <laughs> yeah, they, somewhere in Italy is what they say at the title. Oh, the cool. They don't actually give um, specific. I like that. Somewhere in Italy, the aloofness of the location, but mixed with... The feeling that you're shot through a 17-year-old's eyes, no matter who the person is or how you relate to him, the idea is that this young man is in love and he falls in love for seemingly the very first time, not not only from just who, who Army Hammer's character is to them, but also from, you know, the female's characters that come in. He's, he's realizing, you know, his own sexuality for the first time and also, you know, his place in the world, even though I will say that son of a bitch got to hang out in Italy and just do nothing. <laughs> Read, listen to music, play dissect, music. Okay, classic so music. I, his, I'm going to say... <laughs> study old architecture with his dad. Whoever wanders <laughs> into your, you know, beautiful Chateau Marmont in the Italy, maybe you're going to fall in love with them never, no matter who it is. Of course, it's Army Hammer, though. <laughs> and Army Hammer does happen to show up in this. And uh, Timothy Chalamet is in this movie. And I he first comes across my radar in Lady Bird which is what I saw him in this right, yeah. year. And I think most people probably would identify him with that. But the moody kid. I knew that there was something about him in the press where people were sort of holding him up and going, James Dean? You know, like that. They, they, they just whisper this thing, you know, with young actors usually they're like, you got to watch this kid. I'm just saying he's going to be amazing. And so I see him in Lady Bird. And, and even though I, I've seen that and I've, and I've spoken my piece about that movie... I didn't see that in that performance of Lady Bird. No. I thought he, you know, that, yeah, he played, he's good. There you go. You know, he plays the role and that's okay. He's the cool kid who's impish and, and in this weird way where you can be really cool in high school by being insanely skinny and very aloof and just into books. Where the hell was this when I was a fucking kid? Anyway, sorry, that's just my own bag. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, he was, he is the new, the, the new the stereotype is to be cool, is to be someone that looks like Timothy Chalamet. <laughs> and that's in high school. All right, cut to Call Me By Your Name, which we have to admit this movie is of grave importance to the filmmaking community because everyone loves the issues that this movie represents. And when done well and insanely well like this, it is a flagship movie where you can, you can, you can hold it up in class and say... For all you naysayers out there that say, you know, whatever you say about movies like this, this is one where it doesn't matter what your viewpoint is. Just watch the fucking Absolutely. movie. Watch the movie and you'll feel love and you'll feel, and you might feel uncomfortable, but in a, you might feel in a really good way. It might change your mind. It might make you think of life in a different way or think about love or sexuality in a different way where it's not Brokeback Mountain, you know, where yeah. people are going, Okay, that is like that's like working class people. That's a little bit too close to home for all you like uh, steel workers out there. Well, but there's like not that, like this you know? big thing too, where it's like they're being. It's like 
I say oppressed, but they're keeping a secret away from everything else. There's a, yeah. a, a an ops that there's an obvious obstacle in their way. Yes, they talked where we know we shouldn't talk about this here. We can't do this here in this movie. But it's not, not like that much you're a, drama. But yeah. you're not actually yeah. seeing the negative forces in interplay with how these people are living their lives and what they're doing and and how they're going about doing it. And I thought that was very very kind of refreshing that it's just it really to was. somebody just actually existing and living a life and being in love. But uh, just in that way where it's not like we're oppressed by society or our parents are getting us down or this or that. It's just, mm, we're going to do this in secret because this is what I'm 17. I've been in love for the first time. It's what we do. I'm going to do this shit in secret. Right. And I like the fact that, you know, the characters in it are almost just as confused as anyone are, you know, about what's right. going on or what they need to give into or what they need to stay away from or what they need to hold secret from each other or to themselves. The movie is just cord and that's the that's the the French new wave part of it that I really like. It's it's a big mystery what you should be feeling because you're just watching a family exist and then characters exist in a reality that we all know exists every single day and could be you sitting across from me, could be me, could be anyone. We've heard the story a thousand times, but first love and new love and just love in general, that's what movies are all about sometimes. And when they tell a love story like this, that they, they do it so well, you just can't help but smile by the end of it and go... I know it's supposed to be sad too, but I'm not sad when the movie's over. You yeah, know? but it, yeah, it's I, uh, you should be. And I, okay, okay, I guess I am sad when the movie is over. And okay, I did cry like a baby, you know, at the end of this movie. But at the same time, it does well you up with that nostalgia of going. Oh, I remember what it was like to be 17. But at the same time, you're going. Yeah. You're 17 years old. You're gonna get over this. Get <laughs> like, you know, Come it's on, not. Man. <laughs> it's just <laughs> Army <first> Hammer. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> how how in love could you oh, be with Army Hammer? Okay, my God. And and I almost <laughs> I almost say in my review of this, which which I probably should hold back, but fuck it, that's the podcast. Um, if you can get over the fact of who Army Hammer is. In the pop culture celebrity world, yes, this is a better movie. Absolutely, yeah, and that's the. I only wish this was thing. the first time I'd ever seen Army. I mean, yeah. uh, maybe the Social Network, and then he didn't do anything for f like a few years, yeah. and he does this. That'd have been great. It would have been yeah. fantastic. Uh, but yeah, I he played that. He was really he was really good in that part. Yeah. And actually, the 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 way the movie sort of cast the light on his stardom, it kind of makes me rethink the status that he's had in, I, in culture already because he didn't really have it with me. It was always like the, well, we'll see. I told you. Wait and see. Lone Ranger oh, is, is a great it. movie. I'm just saying. <laughs> I've told people that since it came out. He's fantastic. Army Hammer is the best, but he also did that stupid cameo in the Entourage movie, so that ruins everything, and then we start all the way over. <laughs> but no, Social Network, one of my favorite, definitely one of my, ooh, it's so close to being my favorite movie in the 2000s, but... Army Hammer in that, unbelievable. Army Hammer in this, unbelievable. Hate his fucking name still. Uh, <laughs> Oil Tycoon Army family too. Hammer. What the fuck are we doing? Um, <laughs> anyway, but yes, if if you just stay out of the gossip rags and stay out of Us Weekly and all that shit, and this is the first time you see these two actors, you go, this young kid, that's pretty pretty awesome that he threw himself so so into He's this role. Yeah. Timothy Chalamet, we should say, that's the young kid I'm talking about. He does jump right in. He goes for it. He goes for broke. And you believe this kid's pain. You believe this kid's love. And you believe everything about this kid. And then Army Hammer comes in. And you know what? He's as aloof as Army Hammer would be in real life. <laughs> He's, he, you know, he, he kind of almost just is Army Hammer in the 80s. I don't it, know. Yeah. You know. To me, it just felt very natural for him to be in this performance because he has, a, he has this strange inflection that he has with most words when he has casual dialogue. That it's uh, That's you in an interview. That's you when you're acting. <laughs> that's you when you're angry. That's you when you're sad. But, you know, it's kind of like Clint Eastwood. He does it pretty well, you yeah. know? And the emotional side of his performance in this, I'm kind of shocked that... He didn't get a little nod this year or anything. That, I mean, uh, Christopher Plummer sneaking in at the very end for a supporting actor. Mm. Some could say Woody Harrelson uh, for three billboards because yeah. he was even in and out, but he dropped off because he was. Uh, I don't think. He, I don't think SAG was he nominated for SAG. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> I know it was like Golden Globes, and it seemed like yeah. And I, I was very surprised at the end not to. I hadn't seen the movie yet. This was the the, the big one I had to see. Um, of all the movies out, but yeah, I was surprised he didn't get nominated. Very glad Chalamet got nominated, though. Totally deserves it. Michael Stuhlberg as supporting actor for The Father. Unbelievable. He um, needs an Oscar. This he he was actually Stolberg. that speech at the end. That that's he gives, one of that's my what favorite. Made me, 
That's what made me cry. That well, my it favorite was like, thing I've ever seen in a movie. I've yeah. never seen anything like that before, where a character, a father character, he's supposed because what you see is the after school special father character. You know, right. where he's like, I don't want to know what's going on. Don't tell me what's going on. Don't tell your mother. But it was like the opposite of that. And a movie about love had nothing but love in it. And it wasn't this deep, dark side where it was like, there's some kind of thing that's evil in this movie. It There was no evil in this movie. It was right. beautiful. It was just, yes, this exists. And everyone knows about it. And everything is cool. And the father character gives this amazing speech at the end where he's going... I see a lot of me in you, and I've never had anything like I've seen. You know, you had it at 17 years old, and just, just watch the movie just for that sequence. Even if you can't get into the movie for whatever reason it is until the end, that last speech will have you. If you if you understand the movie, you understand it in that last speech. And and Stuhlbarg's not even a big part of the movie, really. He's just kind of a minor character. Yeah. But then he shows up and and delivers this soliloquy while Timothy Chalamet just sits and listens. And between the two of them, between, you know, Stuhlbarg's monologue and his son's reaction sitting across from him, you, I, it's so weird, you know, at, at my age, you know, you feel like you are the dad and you feel like you are the son through nostalgia at the same time. You feel like you've, you've been to this place before, even though these people had incredible means to to live right. in this weird chateau in the middle of Italy, you know, with this research assistant, he's a professor and all this. All the backstory doesn't really matter to me, but it just seemed so relatable between every character in the movie, whether it was the girl that shows up, you know, and they're kind of just discovering like, oh, I can I can kiss somebody for the first time. Right. Or, you know, Army Hammer shows up and he's kind of like the 20, you know, 23 year old or whatever that's discovering his career and he's going over to Europe for the first time. And even the mother who's kind of aloof to the whole thing going, yeah, you know, I just care for my kids and I just, you know, I'm kind of, you know, person around town. And it seems like this was the most relatable movie of the year to anyone and everyone in the world. And I only wish that you could show this movie to anyone and they would honestly just say, I get it. It's about love. And it's yeah. a brilliant representation of love and it should be on the AFI's top 100 romances for sure. And if it isn't in 20 years, I'd be shocked actually. They didn't do a uh, list last year for uh, 100 movies. For the 30th oh, or really? anniversary, that was 97, yeah. 2007, should have been 2017. They didn't still, uh, revise it. You know, they're still trying to figure out why uh, Lord of the Rings is on there. And there's, there's, sea Biscuit. Yeah, Sea Biscuit. <laughs> Whatever there the fuck we put on. <laughs> oh, God, you know, I don't even fucking understand that list. But that's the thing. Lists don't, even, don't matter. But if you take a recommendation from us on the Four Seasons of Film podcast, this was my favorite movie until I saw Phantom Thread. And I've only seen Phantom Thread once, but I've seen this twice. And it's going to be close. The top five that I that I have in my head, many are in contention, but Phantom Thread, this movie, I really like both of those movies for different reasons. But those those to me are the best movies of the year. Those because they elicit they elicit such interesting things. And then Three Billboards, you throw that in there too, and it's just like, ah, that's badass, balls out. <laughs> but I don't know. It's going to be an interesting year at the uh, at the Oscars for us uh, at the Four Seasons of Film because it's it's a year where no two movies are the same, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, everything does kind of different things for you. Um, yeah, I'm only talking about my favorites, not movies in general, but my favorite movies have nothing to do with each other if you look at each thing, besides love. <laughs> but that's just a general theme, you know. I really liked it. I thought it was I thought it was excellent. Enough to watch it twice in a matter of a couple of days, too. Where it was Yeah, like, I would definitely watch shit. this again. I was yeah, I um yeah, this was one I didn't necessarily hold back on it, but I thought it was gonna be a certain type of well, okay, a version of this movie I've seen before. But it was a version of a different movie I'd seen before. Yeah. Uh the coming of age, growing up and being a teenager and experiencing life and learning and Loving figuring yourself out. I mean, that's it was great. I love that it was that. <laughs> It'd be a great double bill for Lady Bird. Lady Bird. I was and then those this two movie, movies. Yeah, I really, I, really interesting. I, I got to see this movie again. Coming by your name, but yeah, it it fit in that same kind of that that same kind of category for me with Lady Bird. And this definitely is probably. I still think I like Phantom Thread better, but this movie, yeah, absolutely, probably my second favorite movie of the year. But I can't believe I loved it so much. Yeah. 
I think it was kind of shocking for me too. You get to the end and I'm crying and I'm going, what the fuck is going on with me? I can't even, oh, and I go, well, I'll just go with it. You know what? I'm crying my ass off right now. Yeah, that, that uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the last, uh, it was like three minutes where they just hold on Chalamet's face when he's yeah. sitting in the fireplace. That alone is just fucking brilliant. Poor kid. And that kid, he's 22 <laughs> years old, for God's sake. Yeah, I know. I go, oh, man. I mean, he's an actor, but, you know, whatever. It's yeah, go a, ahead, kid. It's a fantastic, fantastic moment. Yeah. Mm. Well, let's ruin this by bringing in Andy Rogers. Watch and weep, you furry fucker. And I, we usually bring you in because y- you ruin everything that we uh, like. And famously, you've done never, we, Darkest Hour, same thing. You know, we brought him oh, in. Yeah, we yeah. talked. We, we love that movie. And then we bring you in and you shit all over it. Um, so I, I'm scared to ask. And you got three minutes. <laughs> so, you know, we can keep this short. Um, Thank God. You know, I agree with 99% of what you guys said. I enjoyed the movie. I, I thought it was really good. It's in my top. Cool. Let's like, just go to the 1%. 1%. Yeah. <laughs> what audiences haven't heard yet. Yeah. I mean, the 1% is, is like, I agree with 99%, but the 1% is, but I thought Har- Army Hammer was a fucking dick in this the whole time to this, this kid that wanted to be in love and, you know. And well, sure. He's the, older than this kid, though. But I, but I was like, what the fuck? Why are you fucking with him? Nobody man? has you their know? shit together at 22. And isn't well, Army Hammer supposed to be like 23 in this movie or something like that? He's in his 20. I mean, yeah. Like, come on, a, dude. <laughs> they're both kids. Oh, yeah. sure. Okay, yeah. He's, he's kind of playing with the kid's emotions, but he also is all... He, he doesn't even know what the hell's going on either. He's in Italy, and it's Plus, the 80s, and he's just having a good time, There is that whole line, too, where he uh, tells him, like, when uh, Army calls a, uh, Timothy's character and... Uh, he says, you know, I think your dad knows about us. And I was like, you know, your dad's really cool about it. You know, my dad would have sent me off to military school by oh, now. Right. So right. he is coming off from an impressive. They're both Jewish, too. I mean, one's, you know, less Jewish than the other. The other one's like, you know, Army Hammer's character is Jewish from the get-go. The other one says we we hide it. Right. But there there's different dynamics going on. Army Hammer's straight from states. Uh, 80s, by the way. Uh, pre-8s. Yeah, and Chalamet's so. character is living in Italy, and he's laid back as shit. And Parents are European, like yeah, they're, they're God, Italian, man. French, whatever. I mean, that's a okay. little more. So, so in essence, you're saying you're a dick. No, I'm not a dick. All right, hundred percent, hundred percent. Okay, cool. You are a dick. <laughs> no, no, damn it. <laughs> I fucked up again. Okay, so the one percent is you. You just thought it was mean. What I, but I, I guess that one percent ties into I couldn't. I, I couldn't separate Army Hammer from the character because if it was right. like you guys were saying, the character did he uh, just need a mask? Is that all he needed? Um, and then Johnny Depp? No, no Johnny Depp needed. <laughs> we never have to. No, just big no. Okay, but didn't you feel the love? Didn't oh, I you did. Feel- I thought it, it was a beautiful movie. It was such a beautiful movie. So I, I it's watched, more like uh, I watched it it's two like and a half. Eighty percent, twenty percent. You're talking about because one percent is nothing. One percent saying like that's what held me back from the movie. One percent. I wasn't held back. I'm kidding. That's like a cr- that's thing. like a crumb of cheese. A it's not actually. Well, I mean, if you thought that he was more threatening than he was inviting, that's a different aspect angle you were looking at did you think that he was gonna like eventually like harm the kid or something no 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 no. i just thought he was just mean not not in like a well isn't that good though he, he, that he fooled you <laughs> I, I guess so yeah <laughs> that's it yeah that was it i thought it was great <laughs> I- oh and this is why elvis mitchell never never invite us on with you uh <laughs> tcm thank god robert osborne is dead yeah, there's, we will never be able to bring Andy Drudges onto a panel at NYU. It's it's, it's not gonna be able to. It's not gonna be able to happen. Ninety nine percent was amazing. One percent, that character was mean. That was my. <laughs> What's wrong I, with you? I'm an audience member. I'm a viewer. That was my opinion. And I don't get it. He was helping the kid along. He was actually resisting the kid for a while. It was like, more the, the kid was the, was the like, kid was the one who grabbed his. I'm junk telling in the first you. Yeah, but like, then no, after, we're, we're doing after this. that, then yeah, then the yeah the kid was eager, but the other, then Army Hammer was just a little bit too. Oh, mean. what's he supposed to do? You know, like uh, throw up his whole life and like go for the 17 year old kid and tell everybody he moved to Italy. He's but, a research assistant. No, he that's could, a, it, I'm not saying that he he couldn't have made that choice. That's a tough fucking decision to make, man. Have you ever put yourself in his shoes and said you were the 17 year old the whole time, weren't you? I mean, just I, love me, and you're. I know. And he's going. Listen, I'm older than you. Isn't this? Isn't this uh, easy to just say this? And you're going. Just love me. Okay, David. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Really? Well, okay. I'm, so you and he was still having flings with women too. So it's not how hey, it is, uh, secure and everything he was and everything and all that. I it mean, was the '80s. 
Early 80s, too. Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. I thought man. it was the you 70s. No, you didn't even. It wow. Said it says in the beginning. Three in the first. And I'm just kidding. I knew it was the and 80s. And with <laughs> the musical choices, the dance sequences, really? The oh, fucking I know that song. 70s? Yeah. yeah. No, I was just kidding. I mean, just Army Hammer's shorts and the tube socks alone, man. My, I mean, my dad wore that like every day in the 80s. So, Jesus. It was based on my dad. <laughs> but you never know. Um, really disappointed by you. Why? I enjoy, I love the movie. 1%. Jeez. That was it. That was it. That's good. I was saying how good it is with my percentage. Okay, but you thought it was mean. No, I didn't think it was mean. I just thought Army Hammer could have been nicer. But that's... I- not the point of the movie. I understand that. If That's it why was, it's one percent. It, no, if it literally was like if it was two a relationship maybe. between two people where one person wanted it so bad and the other person was not resistant, this would just be twenty seven dresses or something like that. It would be there would be no drama to it at all. He had to be something to this, you know, as the other side of the relationship. Otherwise, what the hell are we doing here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I really love you. I, I love you too. Did, Movie's over. And did he say too, like in the beginning, like yeah, I. I thought maybe you were, so I I touched your shoulder, and then you waved me off, and I was like, well, shit, kid doesn't like me, so I kid was, I like was cold yeah. to you. Moving on. And then the kid was like, no, wait, I do like Did you, you actually watch this Do you movie know what's going on? I watched it two and a half times. You watched... <laughs> so, no, what we learned from you, that's a total lie. How many times have you watched it? Two and a half. Again, what you have... You've always been told you lie when you say... Okay, I yeah, see you it. Can't I've seen times. it two times. Two okay, times. You know, one more time just for the audience to hear. I saw it two times. Now, why? Why is it not two and a half? Because I fell asleep midway during my second viewing of and the film. And it doesn't count, right? And you picked it up from where you left off. No, I started no. it over. No, he didn't see it. He watched just half a time. Anyway. <laughs> see, there you go. So, it's 100%. It's, well, it's slam dunk. Slam dunk. Oh, my God. See, the, the problem with you and this movie, and most... Actually, the problem with you in every movie is you don't know what you're watching... So you just try to make it bearable enough for you no, to get through I it. it. And then when somebody asks you what you say, you think, well, what can I say to seem intelligent? 1% of this was disappointing. Well, dude, you guys just talked 20 minutes about it. What are, you guys know a lot more about movies. It's a <laughs> podcast! <laughs> well, most people don't know that. Okay, I next mean, time we'll just shut up and say nothing and have dead air for 20 minutes, Scotty. We'll do one minute and then we'll turn it over to Sir Andy Drogenis for the play-by-play and everyone will be riveted. I mean, come on. That's and a- tell me in reality that would be that would be good for Pod. I mean, no, but... Wow. This is why you were never invited back. <laughs> Why? You are uh, fucking fired. I, wait, can I come back and talk about <laughs> my crap night? I don't even know if you deserve it at this point. <laughs> Why? Because this this was ridiculous. It's 100% now, man. It's fine. I enjoyed <laughs> the movie. I thought it was great. For what reasons? Because it was a story about love and just figuring out, like, or not even figuring not it to out. you. <laughs> I know, yeah, exactly. The movie was about a dick who didn't accept love <laughs> from the person he was in kid. love with. No, he loved him. He loved him. They loved each other, man. They that was that. But he, one was mean. Yeah, I just thought. Oh him. my god, my little snowflake. I know. I wanted this to be. It was. A, it was a very uplifting movie. So, what do you think he was thinking about by the fireplace at the end of that movie? How much he lo- he uh, he loved Arby Hammer, and then oh, okay, so you you okay? Oh come on, you were broken up with that same age. You didn't feel didn't feel how how deep that was. I did, I did. That's what he was thinking about it. And you didn't say news. anything about this movie besides Arby Hammer was a dick. What? I you told me to keep it to three minutes. Now we're going talking on six minutes. Three minutes. Said. That was a non-point. Three minutes of I uh, like ninety nine percent of it. One percent. What was the one percent? Arby Hammer was mean. That's thirty seconds. Well, it felt a lot longer than that. I know. <laughs> Your segments always do. No, I, it was a beautiful story about love. Oh I was my moved. I was God, touched. why do you do this to us? Thank you very much, everyone. Four Scenes of Film will continue next week with our final Oscar movie, Get Out. No, that's the movie's title. And that'll be next week from the Four Scenes of Film podcast. Thank you very much to Scotty Brown. See ya. Andy Drogenis. After we do Get Out, um, we have the Oscars episode, which I host write, direct, perform. So uh, make sure to tune in for the last episode, but make sure to tune in for the Four Seasons of Film Academy Awards, the fifth annual. I, with Four Seasons of Film, we'll continue next week. Thank you very much.